Hello everyone and welcome to Control Engineering Dynamics and Optimization Tutorials. In these tutorials we present a real and applicable knowledge with special emphasis on implementation of algorithms. This video is dedicated to one fundamental concept that appears in a number of fields such as control theory, optimization, dynamical systems, signal processing and physics. That is, in this tutorial, we provide a gentle introduction to gradients and level curves. Now, some of you might stop me over here and ask me the following question. Why did you create this tutorial when online and on YouTube and on the internet we can find tons of tutorials covering the concept of gradient and level curves? Well, what makes this video tutorial special is that I explain gradients and level curves from the control engineering perspective. Moreover, this tutorial will be one part of a big tutorial, or better to say a series of tutorials on how to implement model-based control and signal processing algorithms in hardware by using C and C++. And consequently, we have to start from scratch. We have to start from the concept of gradient and make sure that students properly understand this concept. Since gradients are the core of a number of optimization algorithms and optimization algorithms are cores of control engineering and signal processing algorithms. Before I start, I would like to mention the following. Those of you who are my subscribers or who follow this channel know by now that I always create a post that nicely summarizes everything that will be explained in this video. And consequently, here is the post. This post contains figures, as you can see, all the equations and all the explanations. A link to this post is given in the description below. Secondly, it took me a significant amount of time, energy, planning and effort to create this video tutorial and the post that you can see over here. And consequently, I kindly ask you to press the like and subscribe buttons. Thank you very much. Let's start. We explained the concept of gradient by using this example. We are considering this function. This function is a real function of two independent variables, x and y, that are real variables. Obviously, this is a quadratic function in two dimensions, and the graph of this function is shown over here. x-axis and y-axis intersect somewhere over here and we can observe that this function achieves the minimum value at x is equal to 2 and y is equal to 2. Now the question is what is the gradient of this function at a certain point? From the mathematical point of view the gradient is a vector defined by this equation. Let us interpret this equation. We construct the gradient as follows. We take the function f and to construct the gradient, we take partial derivatives of f with respect to its independent variable. So the first entry of the gradient vector will be partial derivative of f with respect to x. The second entry of the gradient vector is the partial derivative of f with respect to the vector y, actually to the scalar value y. Here, nabla, this symbol, is a symbol transforming f into the gradient. Here, you should stop and keep in mind this. f is a scalar function. This means that it, this f function takes real values. However, the gradient of this function is 
a two-dimensional vector. It's a two-dimensional vector since we have two independent variables. That is, the function f depends on two independent variables. Let us go back to our function that looks like this and let's compute its gradient. Here it is. The partial derivative of f with respect to x is 2, x minus 2. The partial derivative of f with respect to y is 2 multiplying y minus 2. The gradient at a point x is equal to 10, y is equal to 10 is obviously equal to 16 and 16. Let us graphically illustrate this gradient. The gradient is illustrated at this figure. That is, the gradient at a point 10, 10. It has projection 16 and 16. So from this point over here, we need to add an x projection. And here is the x projection. This part over here is equal to 16. And we need to add a y projection. This part over here is equal to 16. So when we take two vectors, this is 16 and this is 16. And if we add them together, we construct our gradient. And that's the precisely vector that you can see over here. When the function f depends on n variables, x1, x2, until xn, then the gradient is defined by this equation. The principle is the same. The gradient is a vector and we construct its entries by taking the partial derivatives of f with respect to all the independent variables. In this case, we have the first entry partial derivative of f with respect to x1. Then we have the partial derivative of f with respect to x2 and until partial derivative of f with respect to xn. For presentation clarity, let us return to the example of the function of two variables. Everything explained in this tutorial can easily be generalized to the case of functions depending on three or more variables. Several important facts about this gradient should be observed. First of all, the gradient is equal to zero at the point x is equal to two and y is equal to two. Again, here's our gradient vector and we can obviously observe that this expression is equal to zero for x is equal to two and y is equal to two. Now, going back to the mathematical form of our function that looks like this, we can observe that at x is equal to 2 and y is equal to 2, the function is minimum. That is, the minimum of the function is achieved for x is equal to 2, y is equal to 2, that is for the point for which the gradient is equal to 0. This is very important fact. On the other hand, if our function was, for example, given by the equation 7, that is, if we take the original function and we add the minus sign, we basically flip the function, and the gradient looks like this. We can see that, again, gradient is equal to 0 at 2 and 2. However, the function now achieves the maximum value for the point x is equal to 2, y is equal to 2. These simple examples confirm that the candidate points for local minimum and maximum functions are the points for which their gradients become equal to 0. Keep in mind that these are only necessary conditions for a local extremum. The sufficient conditions actually involve Hessians of functions. And these topics will be covered in the next tutorial. 
So the first thing to keep in mind when analyzing gradients of functions or in the sequel we will introduce cost function is that the candidate points for a minimum or a maximum of functions are given by setting the gradient equal to zero. And the solution of this vec vector equation will give us points, or better to say candidate points, for which the function can have a minimum or maximum. Next, here is another very important fact about gradients. The gradient is a vector whose value at a certain point is the direction and rate of the locally fastest increase of the function f. For example, the gradient at the point x is equal to 10, y is equal to 10 of our original function is given by this equation. Its entries are 16 and 16 at the point 10, 10. Consequently, the direction of the fastest increase is this vector. I can simply take this scalar value 16 out and inside I have this vector. Let us numerically illustrate this important fact. That is, let us show that starting at the point x10, y10, the direction of the fastest increase of the function is positively collinear with this vector over here. Graphically, we want to show something like this. If this is our gradient, and if we start at this point, we basically want to show that if we move along, or better to say in the direction of the gradient, right? if we take the small step in the direction of the gradient, the increase of our quadratic function will be the fastest. So if this is our quadratic function, the increase in this direction of the function is the fastest compared to any other direction. For example, we can move in this direction and take a small step, or we can move in this direction and take a small step. However, the function will increase in the fast with the fastest rate if we move along the direction of the gradient. That is, if we take small steps in the direction of the gradient. Let us show this. Suppose that we are at the point x is equal to 10, y is equal to 10. And suppose that we move in the direction of a vector that is positively collinear with the gradient vector. We assume that we take a small step in this direction. We can obviously select an infinite number of vectors that are collinear with the gradient vector. The most natural choice is, of course, the unit vector. So, I constructed a unit vector that is collinear with this vector. So, the new point I denoted by x1, y1, at which we want to evaluate the value of the function f is given by this equation. I start at 10, I move for this amount in the x direction, and I arrive at this point over here. Then I start at y1 again, I start at 10, I move for this amount to obtain this value. Then I substitute x1 and y1 in the equation of the function and I obtain 151.6272. And I expect that this will be the largest value of the function compared to taking steps in any other direction. Let us show that. Let us pick an arbitrary direction. Let us assume that we again start at 10, 10 and we move in the direction of the another unit vector, which makes an angle of 60 degrees with respect to the x-axis. Again, we assume that we take small steps in this direction. Here is our unit vector and let's step in the direction of this unit vector. This unit vector makes 60 degrees with the x-axis. Let us evaluate the value of the function f at the new point in direction of this vector. The new point again is defined by these two equations. x2 is 10.5. I basically constructed this expression by taking 10, the starting point, then I take this step and I arrive here. Similarly, I start at 10, I take this small step, arrive 
at this projection. The value of the function then is obviously given by substituting x2 and y2 in the equation of, for f and I obtain this value. Now you can compare this value with the value over here and I can conclude that this value is indeed smaller. And in the same manner, it can be numerically verified that if we take any any direction around any unit vector from the point 10, 10, except for the direction of the unit vector that is positively collinear with the gradient, and if we take a small step, we will always have a smaller function value than the value of the function in the direction of the unit vector positively collinear with the gradient vector. This fact about gradients is very important for developing optimization algorithms, as you will see in the next tutorials. Then, to properly understand gradients, it's also important to introduce the concept of level curves for the case when the function f depends on two variables and the concept of level surfaces for the case when the function f depends on three or more variables. Again, let us consider the function f. The level curve of this function is defined by this equation, where c is a constant. Obviously, the equation 17 defines a curve that is the intersection of the function f with the horizontal plane parallel to the xy plane and with the distance of c from the xy plane. So graphically, this means the following. Going back to our quadratic function, that can be illustrated like this. We take a plane with a distance of c from the xy plane and we simply slice this function. The intersection is obviously a circle that I illustrate over here. So here is the here is the intersection. And this intersection is the level curve. Mathematically, we can obtain the level curve by simply setting C in our equation and this is the result. And obviously, this is a, an equation of a circle with the radius equal to square root of C. Graphically, here is the level curve in x and y plane, that is, this is the projection of the level curve onto the x and y plane. In the same manner, we can define the level surfaces for functions with three or more variables. For example, let us assume that we have a sphere and the level surface is given by this equation. Obviously, this is a sphere with the radius of square root of c centered at zero. Now, here is the main question. Why are the level curves and level surfaces relevant to the concept of gradients? Because of this reason, the gradient at a point x, y is perpendicular to the level curve or level surface that passes through that point. More precisely, the gradient at the point x, y is perpendicular to the tangent in the case of level curves or the, to the tangent plane in the case of level surfaces of the level curve or in the case of surfaces level surface at the point x, y. This is illustrated in this figure. What happens over here is that if this is our level curve represented by this magenta circle and if this is a point at which we compute the gradient the gradient will be perpendicular to the tangent line of the level curve at that point. And again, this is a very important fact for developing optimization algorithms. Okay, that would be all for today. I hope that you like this video. If you like the videos I create, please press the like and subscribe buttons. Thank you very much.